Hello everyone. I am Himanshu Vasnani from Department of Mechanical Engineering. I am here to discuss with you on the subject non-destructive evaluation and testing. Subject code is ME419, unit number 4 in the series, lecture number 26. And today's topic are magnetization equipment for magnetic particle testing, magnetic field indicators. So, so learning objective for today are to provide the students for with the uh, with the basic understanding of magnetization equipment for magnetic particle testing to know about the concept of magnetic field indicators and our learning outcome after the lecture will be the students will have an understanding of magnetization equipment for magnetic particle testing and students will understand the concept of magnetic field indicator okay so now we will discuss more about magnetic field indicators in this lecture. So magnetization equipment for magnetic particle testing. See to properly inspect a part for cracks or other defects. It is important to become familiar with the different types of magnetic fields and the equipment used to generate them. Like we have been studying about magnetic particle testing in the past lecture and we have studied the basic principle of magnetic particle testing, how the magnetic field is applied in this for testing and what are the major defects that we find out. So here they say that to properly inspect a part for cracks and other defects, it is important to become familiar with the different types of magnetic fields and equipment for in equipment used to generate them. Like one of the primary requirements for detecting a defect in a ferromagnetic material is that the magnetic field induced in the part must intercept the defect at a 45 to 90 degree angle. Okay, say they the, say they have given you a particular degrees. Okay, it's like 45 to 90 degree angle. In this, if you want to, uh, uh, they they are given this primary requirement that for detecting a defect in a material like in a ferromagnetic material. Okay. So is that that the magnetic field should be induced in the part that to intercept the defect at a 45 to 90 degree angle. So the flaws that are normal like 90 degrees to the magnetic field will produce the strongest indications because they disrupt more of the magnetic flux. Okay. Now therefore, a uh, proper for proper inspection of the component, it is for important to be able to establish. A magnetic field in at least two directions. Okay, we have discussed this thing previously in earlier lectures also. Now a variety of equipment exists to establish the magnetic field for magnetic particle testing. One way is to classify the equipment. One way to classify the equipment is based on its portability. Okay, and some equipments is designed to be portable so that inspections can be made in the field and some is designed to be stationary for ease of inspection in the laboratory or manufacturing facility. So this is how they have classified the equipment also. Like some uh, equipments are portable. They have made portable so that you can do the testing in the field also. And some equipment are designed stationary because you want to inspect some uh, materials in the lab also or where the manufacturing is done or the manufacturing facility is there. Okay, so the let's go with the further. Now we discuss about portable equipment. The first, okay. Now permanent magnets. The first category is permanent magnets. Now the first type, sorry, the permanent magnets. Permanent magnets can be used for magnetic particle inspection as a source of magnetism bar magnets or horseshoe magnets okay the use of industrial magnets is not popular because they are very strong and they require significant strength to remove them from the surface and so they are difficult and sometimes dangerous to handle okay now you can see in the diagram how this uh, permanent magnets are, are set up is done okay and then uh, the uh, permanent magnets are sometimes used for by divers for inspection in underwater environment and or other areas such as explosive environment where 
electromagnets cannot be used. Okay, you can see that the bone and magnets are used by the divers. Okay, if you want, if they want to do any inspection in the underground water, or by certain uh, uh, inspectors uh, for searching explosive environments. Okay, the electromagnets cannot be used. So, bone and magnets can also be made small enough to fit into tight areas where electromagnets might not fit. So uh, they have their applications, these permanent magnets, they have their applications where electromagnets also cannot be used. Okay, so for that also they are also made small enough uh, so that they can be easily adjusted into tight areas where electromagnets uh, might not fit. So the permanent magnets also have their significant applications. Okay. Now electromagnetic yokes. An electromagnetic yoke is a very common piece of equipment that is used to establish a magnetic field. Okay, uh, earlier we studied about permanent magnets. Now we're going with the electromagnetic yoke. So they say that the this is a very common piece of equipment. This electromagnetic yoke is a very common piece of equipment that is used to establish a magnetic field. Now how they do that? A switch is included in the electric circuit so that the Current and therefore the magnetic field can be turned on and off. Okay, so they have a switch in the electric circuit to which they uh, switch on and switch off the current so that the magnetic field can be turned on and off accordingly. Now they can be powered with AC alternating current from a wall socket or by direct current from a battery pack. Okay. We have discussed about AC and DC uh, in previous lectures. Okay, for you can lecture, refer from them. Now, this type of magnet generates a very strong magnetic field in a local area where the poles of the magnet touch the part being inspected. Okay, when you switch on the power, they say that this type of magnets they generate a very strong magnetic field in a local area where the poles, you know, where the poles. Of the magnet touch the part being inspected. So some yokes can lift weight in excess of 40 pounds. Okay, so in this way they say. Then prods. Okay, uh, in magnetic particle testing, uh, prods are handheld electrodes that are pressed against the surface of the component being inspected to make contact for passing. Electrical current that is alternating current or diode current through the metal. You can see in the diagram also how they are pressing, okay, uh, against the surface of the component. They say that these plots are handheld electrodes, okay. You can see the hand of the person in the diagram also that are pressed against the surface of the component being inspected to make contact. For passing electrical current, for passing electrical current, alternating current or diode current through the metal. Okay. Now, rods are typically made from copper and have an insulated handle to help protect the operator. Okay. These rods, these the, the electrodes that are using, these are used in this instrument. Uh, these are made from copper. Okay, and uh, moreover, they have a handle that is insulated, and the insulation is done to protect the operator that is operating the device. So, one of the prods that a uh, trigger switch, uh, one of the prods has a trigger switch so that the current can be quickly and easily turned on and off. Okay, now it uh, apart from the handle, they are telling that they the rods they have a trigger switch, okay, so that the current can be quickly turned on and off accordingly. Okay, so sometimes the two rods are connected by any insulator. You can see in the image to facilitate one hand operation. Okay, and this is referred to as dual prod, and this is commonly used for weld inspections. In this way, uh, they say that when there is a switch, okay, so the switch uh, turning on and off will uh, allow the flow of current, and accordingly, the 
the testing will be done in this okay so they say that uh, sometimes they also go for two prods okay that are connected by any insulator you can see in the image to facilitate only one hand operation okay and this is you can say this is referred to as dual prod okay and is commonly used for some uh, welding inspections see in the welding we have studied about different different defects that are commonly found like crater crack or uh, weldman crack or you can say fusion zone is not proper they we have studied about different different defects in welding so uh, this inspection is this uh, the prods that are they, these help in uh, properly inspecting the welding discontinuities more easily okay how a caution is required when using prods because uh, electrical arcing can occur and cause damage to the components if proper contact is not maintained between the prods and the component surface so there is a risk in this that it may uh, you can say uh, cause damage okay to the workpiece or the component if uh, you do not maintain a proper contact between the prods and the component surface or the workpiece surface so uh, due to this reason the use of prods is not allowed when inspecting aerospace other electrical component so you you have a uh, uh, there's a checkpoint for this that that due to this reason that it can damage the component also the use of prods it is not allowed when inspecting aerospace or other electrical component okay to help prevent arcing the Prod tips should be inspected frequently to ensure that they are not oxidized, covered with scale and other contaminant or damaged. They say that to uh, prevent such arcing, okay, the prod tips, the prod tips, okay, that are using should be inspected frequently to ensure that they are not oxidized, okay, covered with scale. Other contaminants or damaged. So in this way, you can uh, you cannot uh, you can say keep a check that the prod tips are okay. They are not oxidized, okay, and uh, any kind of uh, contaminant or damage is not there at the prod tips. You should check this to prevent arson. Okay, so uh, we have uh, discussed just about. Prod and uh, electromagnetic yokes, and uh, these both, these both, these both are, uh, you can say, having a switch. Okay, having a switch, and uh, the, when the switch is on, the current is flowing, and then the magnetic field is active. And when the switch is off, then the the current is off. In this, so in this way, they work with the help of switch also. Now, portable coils and conductive cables. Now coils, you can see in the diagram, okay, uh, which is uh, shown in the diagram how the coils are there. So coils and connective cables these are used to establish a longitudinal magnetic field within a component. So when a preformed coil is used, the component is placed against the inside surface on the coil. Okay, what happens? When you want to create a longitudinal magnetic field within a component, so you, you use coils in there. So they say that the coils and conductive cables these are used to establish a longitudinal magnetic field within a component. Okay. So when a preformed coil is used, the coil is preformed, it is used, the component is placed against the inside surface of the coil. Okay, the component is inside surface of the coil. The coils typically have three or five turns of a copper cable within the molded frame. So a foot switch is often used to energize the coil. You have a switch that is energizing the coil. Also conductive cables can be wrapped around the component to form a coil. You can see that in this lower diagram how they are saying that you have a flexible conductive cables. These are Wrapped around uh, a component and which is from a coil. And the number of wraps is determined by the magnetizing force needed and, of course, the length of the cable. The length of the cable obviously matters, but here the 
number of wraps that we are using that we are doing around the component it depends upon the magnetizing force needed for the activity or for the task so normally the wraps are kept as close together as possible so when using a coil or cable wrapped into a coil amperage is usually expressed in ampere terms okay we say that when the wraps are kept as close together as possible so uh, when the when using a coil or cable wrapped into a coil this is the amperage is usually expressed in ampere terms so ampere terms is the amperage shown on the ammeter times the uh, number of turns in the coil okay so here they say that the uh, cables are also uh, helpful in you can say creating a field okay and uh, you can say the the number of wraps of the cable is determined by the magnetizing force that is needed and when you use a coil when you use a coil then uh, the component should be placed against the inside surface of the or surface on the coil so now next is portable power supply so this is also very important you can see in the diagram the setup is there portable power supply because this is portable you can take it to the field also if you want okay this is portable one from one place to another can go the portable power supplies are used to provide the necessary electricity to the boards or coils or cables okay and power supplies are commercially available in a variety of sizes like small power supplies are already provide up to 1500 ampere of half wave diode current or alternating current okay so you can you, you see that there are variety of sizes there are variety of you can see different different sizes are available uh, for you okay and this power supplies these are portable uh, to provide the uh, electricity to the various uh, coils or rods or cables that are using uh, they are small and light enough to be carried and operate on either 120 volt or 240 volt electrical services okay when more power is necessary mobile power uh, can be used because when you require more power then you can use this kind of mobile powers and these units come with the wheels so that they can be rolled where needed you can see the wheels in the diagram on the bottom side okay how they are doing so these units these portable power supplies they come with wheels so that they can be rolled where needed these units also operate on 120 volt or 240 volt electrical services and can provide up to 6000 ampere of alternating current or half wave diode current okay so let's go ahead then stationary equipments now this is uh, we discussed in the starting only that portable equipments are required so that they can be taken to the field and stationary equipments are used for testing in the manufacturing lab only okay so uh, let's start with this that uh, stationary magnetic particle inspection equipment is designed for use in laboratory or production environment okay the most common stationary system is the wet horizontal bench system wet horizontal bench system now this wet wet, uh, wet horizontal units are designed to allow for batch inspection of a variety of components okay here you go with the batch inspections okay and since it is stationary so you can go with a variety of components whatever is there possible for testing the units have head and tail stops okay and uh, with electrical contact that the part can be clamped between so here you can see this is stationary equipment you have the head and tail system okay and uh, within which you can uh, do the you know, the part can be clamped okay and you can have the electric contact between them so circular magnetic field is produced with direct magnetization so if you give with direct magnetization you will feel that a kind of a circular magnetic field is produced in this in stationary equipment okay okay so most units have also a movable coil that can be moved into a place where the indirect, indirect magnetization 
can be used to produce a longitudinal magnetic field. So, uh, since the the previous setup in which the they were having a head and tail stocks with you, and you will feel that uh, a kind of a when you clamp the part, a kind of a circular magnetic field is generated. But apart from these, there there are some. If you want to go with another side, then they say that you some units they have a movable coil, okay, that can be moved in place so that indirect magnetization can be used to produce a magnet to produce a longitudinal magnetic field. Okay, now these coils have five turns and can be uh, obtained in a variety of sizes. Okay, so wet magnetic particle solution is collected and held in a tank. Okay, what to do? The wet magnetic wet magnetic part particle solution is collected and held in a tank. Uh, a pump and a hose system is used to apply the particle solution to the components being inspected. So some of the systems offer a variety of options like electrical current having uh, sort of use for magnetizing the component like alternating current or half wave bad current or Full wave that current. In some units, a magnetization feature is built in, which uses the coil and decaying alternating current. So you can see that the the you can see that here, if you use the wet particle magnetic uh, wet magnetic particle solu uh, solution, you can you can collect it and held in a tank. In this. Okay, so you have a variety of options with electrical current used for. Magnetizing the component like AC or half wave DC or full wave DC. Okay, and uh, you say that uh, uh, if you talk about a demagnetization, then they say that if there are some units also that have a demagnetization built-in feature. Okay, uh, which uses the coil and demagnet and decaying alternating current. So magnetic field indicators. Now you go with the magnetic field indicator. So determining whether a magnetic field is of adequate strength and in the Proper direction is critical when proper magnetic particle testing. When performing magnetic particle testing, they say in the magnetic indicator, determining whether a magnetic field is of adequate strength and in the proper direction is critical when performing magnetic particle testing. So this is there is actually no easy to apply method that permits an exact measurement of field intensity that a Given point given the material. So cutting a small slot or a hole into the material and measuring the leakage field that crosses the air gap with a hall effect meter is probably the best way to get an estimate of the actual field strength in the part. Okay, they are saying that if you use with a hall effect meter, you can say you can easily uh, get the estimate of the actual field strength within the part. Okay, so in this way you can be able to use. And since this is not a practical, there are a number of tools, tools, a number of tools and methods that are used to determine the presence and direction of the field surrounding the component. Okay, so we will start with that Hall effect meter, or you can say a Gauss meter. A Gauss meter is commonly used to measure the tangential field strength on the surface of the path. Okay, it is used to measure tangential field strength on the surface of the part. So by placing the probe next to the surface, a meter measures the intensity in the field of the field in the air adjacent to the component when a magnetic field is applied. I repeat what happens by placing the probe which is next to the surface, the meter, this meter that you are using, Gauss meter. Is actually you can say the meter measures the intensity of the field in the air adjacent to the component being when a magnetic field is applied. So this adjust its advantage of this device, uh, okay, is that it provides a quantitative measure of the strength of the magnetizing force tangential to the surface of the thermometer, and it can be used. For measurement of residual magnetic field, and it can be or used repetitively. So this is uh, one of the best advantages is having with you. 
that that it provides a quantitative measure of the strength of the magnetizing piece, magnetizing force, tangential to the surface of the test piece. And secondly, it can be used for measurement of residual magnetic field. That is also good. And it can be used, okay, repetitively. You can use, you can use it repetitively. The main disadvantage is, is thus that a device must be periodically calibrated. So if you calibrate the device at periodic intervals, so obviously you can see the application, the advantages are good as in case of Gauss meter. Okay, it can be used with, you can say, find out the residual magnetic field. Okay, and repeatedly you can, you can use it whenever you want. Now quantitative quality indicators. Okay, the quality, the quantitative quality indicators or artificial flaw standard is often the preferred method of assuring proper field redirection and adequate field strength. Okay, it is used in wet method only. They say that the quantitative quality indicator, QQI in short. Okay. It is, you can say, it is a method of assuring proper field direction and adequate field strength. So, QQI, that is the quality, the quantitative quality indicator, is a thin, sharp, thin strip of around 0.05 to 1.1 mm. Thick. You can see how small the dimensions are of AISI 1005 steel with a specific pattern such as concentric circles or a plus sign. Edge to it, edge on it. So you can see that the, with the help of this the quantitative quality indicator, you say that this is a thin strip, okay, around 0.05 to 0.1 mm thick, and of AISI steel, yes, AISI 105 steel with a specific pattern and such as concentric circles or a plus sign edged on it. So the QQI is placed directly on the surface, okay. Now when the itching side uh, facing the surface, okay, uh, is usually and usually fixed to the surface using a tape. Then the component is then magnetized and particles applied. They say that when the QQI quality, quantitative quality indicator is placed directly on the surface with the itch side facing the surface, then it is usually fixed to the surface okay, using a tape. Then the component is then magnetized and the particles applied. So when the field strength is adequate, the particles will adhere to the or adhere over the engraved pattern and provide information about the field strength. Okay. So here from here you can get the uh, field strength information accordingly. Okay. Uh, about the field direction. The pi gauge. Uh, the pi gauge is a disk of highly permeable material. Okay, and divides into uh, four, six, or eight sections by non-ferromagnetic material such as copper. Okay, here you use copper as a non-ferromagnetic material. Okay, and copper is a non-ferromagnetic material. So you can see that the uh, pi gauge, you can say, is a disk of highly permeable materials which are divided into four or six or eight sections. So the divisions serve as artificial defects that radiate out in different directions from the center. So the sections are furnace raised and uh, copper plated. Okay, the sections that are using in the they are furnace blazed, uh, brazed and copper plated. So the gauge is placed on the test piece copper side up, and the test piece is magnetized. Okay, now here you are magnetizing the test piece in this way. After the particles are applied and the excess removed, okay, the indications, okay, the indications they provide the inspector the orientation of the magnetic field. When the particles are applied, you can say and the excess removed. So you will understand that the indications that provide the inspector for the inspector the orientation of the magnetic field. So pi gauges are mainly used on flat surfaces. These pi gauges are mainly used on flat surfaces such as weldments or steel castings where dry powder is used with a yoke or cross. Okay, I repeat once again, pi gauges are mainly used on flat surfaces such as 
weldment or steel castings where dry powder is used with a yolk or false. Okay, the yolk or false. The pie gauge is not recommended for precision parts with complex shape. Okay, or for you know, for wet method applications or for uh, proving magnetic uh, field magnitude. The gauge should be demagnetized before between reading. Okay. Now here they are saying that the gauge that you are using it should be demagnetized. Okay, between between reading or uh, if you take the next reading, you should demagnetize the gauge before also. Okay. Now slotted strips. Now slotted strips. Okay, this is also very important. The slotted strips are pieces of highly permeable ferromagnetic material with lots of slots of different width. So you can see the slotted strips. So you can say with slots of different widths. Now these strips can be used uh, with the wet or dry method, and they are placed on the test object as it is inspected. The indications produced on the strips give the inspector a general idea of the field strength on a, in a particular area. So this is how they work with the slotted strips and they say that uh, the, the pieces of uh, highly permeable ferromagnetic material with slots of different widths. So you are using this uh, slots of different width, uh, you can say, uh, uh, sorry, uh, these strips, okay, sorry, these strips, they're having slots of different width, they are used with the wet or dry method, okay, and uh, you can say that uh, since these are strips, so these can be placed on the test object and you can inspect it for magnetic particle testing, okay, and the indications that you will get produced on the strips, okay, give the inspector an idea of the field strength in a particular area. Now, magnetic particles. Now, uh, uh, we also uh, know that the particles that are used for magnetic particle inspection are the key ingredients as they form the indications and they alert the uh, inter they alert the inspector to uh, to the presence of defects. Okay, now it is helping the inspector to find out the defects easily. Okay, and then particles sta start out as tiny milled pieces of iron and iron ore. You can say the particles they start out. Uh, the particles start out as tiny milled pieces of iron or iron oxide. You can see a pigment uh, is bonded to the surfaces to give the particles color. Now you are giving color to the particles. Now the metal used for the particles has a high magnetic permeability and low retentivity. So high magnetic permeability is important because it makes the particles attract easily to small magnetic field, magnetic, uh, small magnetic leakage, okay, uh, leakage fields from this continuity such as flaws. Now, uh, we say that the metals that we are using, the use for the particles has high magnetic permeability and low retentivity. So, this high magnetic permeability is important because it makes the uh, particles attract easily to small magnetic leakage fields from discontinuity such as flaws. And on the other hand, the low retentivity. Okay, the low retentivity property is important because the particles themselves never become strong magnetized. So they do not stick to each other or the surface of the part. So particles are available in a dry mix or a wet solution. Okay. So here you will go with that. The retentivity should again uh, also in this was that Low retentivity is important because the particles themselves never become strongly magnetized, so they do not stick to each other or the surface of the part. Okay, so in this way, retentivity is there. Yeah. So, dry magnetic particles, now we should on the dry magnetic particles. Now, these dry magnetic particles, these can typically be purchased in red or black or gray, yellow, and several other colors. So that a high level of contrast between the particles and the part being inspected can be achieved. Okay, you are purchasing this in different different types of colors, and uh, you also say that they have a high level of contrast between the particles and the part being inspected. Okay, uh, the size of the magnetic particles is also very important. Okay. 
the size is important now dry magnetic particles uh, particle products are produced to include the range of particle sizes see that the size of the magnetic particles is also very important like if you go with the dry magnetic particle products they are produced using a range of particle sizes and the fine particles have a different uh, you can say have a, di a diameter of about 50 uh, you can say micrometers while the coarse particles have a diameter of about 150 micrometers fine particles are more than 20 times lighter than that of coarse particles you can see the difference okay in the diagram also you can see that there are different different colors okay for you can say okay so uh, this makes the fine particles more sensitive why because this uh, fine particles are more than uh, 20 times lighter than the coarse particles okay so you can see the difference in the diameter also the fine particles have 50 micrometers diameter and uh, coarse particles have 150 micrometers diameter so uh, this makes fine particles more sensitive to the leakage fields from very small discontinuity however dry testing particles uh, cannot be made exclusively on the of the uh, fine particles where coarse particles are needed to bridge large discontinuity and to reduce the power pow powders dusty nature okay they say that uh, since the the fine particles these the small these are more sensitive to the these leakage fields okay from small discontinuities or defects so here if you talk about a dry particle testing or here we discuss about the dry testing of particles we say that it cannot be made exclusively of, of the fine particles where the coarse particles are needed to reach the large discontinuities and reduce the uh, powders the rusty sorry dusty nature so here they say the additional small particles easily adhere to the surface okay contamination uh, such as remnant dirt or moisture and get trapped in surface roughness features it also should be recognized that the finer particles will be more easily blown away okay by the wind and therefore windy conditions can reduce the sensitivity of an inspection okay also reclaiming the dry particles is not recommended because the uh, small particles are less likely to be recaptured and the ones used will mix uh, and will mix the results in less sensitive inspection okay so you can say that the finer particles uh, if you use uh, for in, in, for in the dry magnetic particles, they will be easily blown away by the wind. So this windy conditions, that blowing of the wind, this can reduce the sensitivity of the inspection. So you cannot, you, you cannot, you cannot claim the dry particles. So here they say that the reclaiming of the dry particles is not recommended because the small particles are less likely to be recaptured. You cannot capture them very small size. And uh, the once used result will mix in, will result in less sensitive inspections. So you can see in the diagrams also how this uh, are shown. The particle shape is also important. If you have a long slender magnet, uh, slender particles tend to align themselves along the lines of the magnetic poles. Uh, however, if uh, dry powder consists only of longer particles the application process would be less than desirable since long particles lack of ability to proton so therefore a mix of rounded and elongated particles is used okay now if now you say you say that what do you do you say you can say that a mix of rounded and elongated particles is used since it results in a dry powder that flows well and maintains good fitability the most dry particle dry particles mix have particles with ld uh, you can say that ld ratios between 1 and 2 now let's start with the uh, dry part uh, sorry if we are studying about the dry particle then you going with the wet particle now wet magnetic particles so magnetic particles are also supplied in a wet suspension okay such as water or oil you can also see that the 
uh, metal particles were supplied in a wet suspension such as water and oil. So the wet magnetic particles testing method is generally more sensitive than the dry because the suspension provides the particles with more mobility and makes it possible for smaller particles to be used. Uh, the particles are typically of uh, 9 micrometers and smaller. Since dust and adherence to surface contamination is reduced or eliminated. So the wet method also makes it easy to apply the particles uniformly to relative large area. So you can see the wet particle testing, it has more, uh, you can say, uh, applicability or more mobility. Okay. So it is. Uh, easy to apply also and uh, moreover if you have a large area then in the wet pyrantic testing you can apply the particles uniformly to all over the large area. So uh, let's start with the quiz because quiz is also important for you to discuss. So let's start with the quiz. Right. <clears throat> so, in the first question for today is like the magnetic particle inspection. The slotted strips are pieces of highly permeable ferromagnetic material with slots of different widths. So, these strips can be used with a wet or a dry method. Okay, so they are placed on the test object as it is inspected. The indication produced on the strips gives the inspector a general idea of the field strength in a particular area. Now we have discussed about this whole thing in the slotted strips where you see that uh, you you are that it is a piece of you can say a ferromagnetic material right with slots of uh, different uh, you can say width and I had shown a diagram also in the previous class in the in this section in the previous section of this lecture also so these strips okay this of different different width these strips can be used within the wet or dry method and uh, they are what they do that they are just placing the thing on the test object and it is inspected and the indications produced on the strips they give the inspector a clear idea of the field strength uh, in a particular area so i think that uh, it is true in this case it is true so in magnetic particle inspection one of the primary requirements for detecting the effect in a Ferromagnetic material is that the magnetic field inducted in the part must intercept the defect at a 45 to 90 degree angle. So you will see that this is the maximum, this is the range in which we are given that the you have to, if in this, in the, if the values come in these uh, degrees, then it can be easily detected. Like you can say that if you want to detect a defect in a ferromagnetic then the magnetic field that is induced in the part it should be intercept the defect at 45 or 90 degree angle. So it is true in this case. Okay, true. Now, in magnetic particle testing, the flaws that are normal at 90 degrees to the magnetic field will produce the strongest indication because they disrupt more of the magnetic flux. So this is true in this case. Now, in magnetic particle inspection, the use of uh, industrial magnets is not popular because uh, they are very strong. They require significant strength, okay, to remove them, and thus uh, they are difficult and sometimes dangerous to handle. So it is true or false, and it is true. Okay, it's true. Now, in magnetic particle inspection, an electromagnetic yoke is a very common piece of uh, industry. Uh, sorry. On this equipment that is used to establish a magnetic field. So a switch is included in the electrical circuit so that the current and therefore the magnetic field can be turned on and off. So it is true or false? It is true. Because here in this you can see the electromagnetic yoke. You can say it is uh, used to establish a magnetic field and it requires a switch. So a switch is included in the electric circuit so that the Current and therefore the magnetic field can be turned on and off. Okay, it is true in this case, it is true. So, in a magnetic particle inspection, the rods are hand handled electrodes that are pressed against the 
surface of the component being inspected and uh, to make contact for passing through electric current through the metal. You can say that uh, uh, if uh, it is true or false, uh, you can say it's true, it's true in this case. So, answer is A, true. Uh, in magnetic particle inspection, the most common stationing system is the wet horizontal bench unit. So, wet horizontal units are designed to allow for batch inspections of a variety of components. So, it is true or false, I think it's true. Answer is A. In magnetic particle inspection, the gauss meter is commonly used to measure the magnetic field strength, uh, measure the tangential field strength. When you talk about gauss meters, you have tangential field strength on the surface of the part by placing a probe next to the surface. The meter measures the, the intensity of the field uh, in the air adjacent to the component when a magnetic field is applied. So, what do you say? It is true or false? It is true, A in this case. Okay. In magnetic particle inspection, the Piece of gauge is a disc of highly permeable material divided into four, six, or eight sections by non ferromagnetic material, which is copper. So the divisions serve as artificial defects uh, that radiate out of the radiate out in different directions from the center. So it is true or false? So it is true in this case. Okay. Now the last question. In magnetic particle inspection, you can say, okay, like the last one is true. Okay. Now, in magnetic particle ins uh, inspection, the pi gauges are uh, mainly used on flat surfaces such as weldments or steel castings where dry powder is used with the yolk or rods. So, it is true in this case. It is true. So, these are some reference books which you can refer in this topic and increase your knowledge regarding this topic accordingly. So, uh, once you should refer these books. Thank you.